Well, hello and welcome everyone to the 2021 Grapevine Gallery Drunch. Our guest for this episode is Roger Williams. Roger Williams is from Santa Fe, New Mexico, and he's lived uh, many different places abroad and uh, fluent in Spanish, master chef of green chilies, fine art oil painter, and workshop teacher extraordinaire. So Roger, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Welcome to my studio. Well, I've got my shirt on. No accident. Just happy. <laughs> oh, no, no mistakes. Just happy accident. I can't read it. <laughs> Bob hey, it's, another, it's another happy accident. <laughs> <laughs> well, for, uh, for all the viewers out there and collectors, one of the purposes of our format this year is to err on the side of caution with COVID and respect everyone's wishes with that. So uh, in the true sense of the word, we're trying to bring the mountain to you as the collector and let everyone shop and view at your own pace and level of comfortability. Uh, as you all can see in Roger's studio, he has an amazing uh, window with excellent north light. And then across from him is like the world's coolest indoor uh, greenhouse and garden. Roger's got this cool raised deal that every time it's right through that magic door right there. Yeah. Every time I'm there to visit Roger, I have my coffee in the morning. I sneak in there and see uh, what's he growing? Tomatoes, basil. Yeah. <laughs> so it's always, it's always a treat to uh, it's go all legal. Roger and Heidi. Yes. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, <clears throat> well, Roger, um, tell us, tell the, you know, the new viewer, the new collector, a little bit about yourself, about you live in Santa Fe and, uh, just kind of let everybody know who you are real quick. Well, I was born in Colorado. I don't want to go over the long list because I'm really old and uh, <laughs> there's a lot of events to cover. But I, I guess I got I was raised by a, a, a fa father and mother. They're both teachers. Uh, my father was an artist. He taught art uh, at, a, at a university in Southern Colorado for 35 years. And that I was exposed to it, but I wasn't interested in art until, until I became, oh, I don't know, 18 years old, maybe 19. And, or maybe it was because my mother dropped me on my head too many times, but I somehow got into it. And uh, with you know pressure from everyone, well, what are you studying? I'm studying art and art history and all these other things. And it enticed me to travel. And uh, so my first major trip that I took when that really influenced my life was a hitchhiking trip to to Western and Eastern Europe. And I spent some five months uh, hitchhiking around there. And what, what really um, I became aware of the fact that I found myself just looking at art museums and not going into bars like, like most kids my age. Of course, I went into a few bars. I didn't have the money on that trip to spend in bars, but uh, I went to all the major art museums and I came back from that trip completely blown out. Um, number one, I, I, didn't, I didn't realize how ignorant I was to the world. First, my education wasn't that bad, but as an American young person, I, I realized I was ignorant. Everybody in Europe my age could speak at least two languages, three languages. So it changed everything. It changed my whole life. So. That's basically, and then what happened, and then I just started studying art, and I started painting, uh, mostly watercolors that time, and I did other things. I did uh, stained glass and different projects that I picked up along the way to earn a living, even ski maps, illustrations for uh, ski areas, and um, any job I could find that was connected to art where I could, um, you know, support by then I had, I had a wife. And so uh, as evolution progressed, I, I started selling paintings. I got my first gallery in Taos, New Mexico. And then uh, later on moved to Santa Fe some 37 years ago. And, it, you know, it was a calling at that point because I really didn't, I did try to get out of art and do other things because it was a it was an occupation that uh, I w I shouldn't have listened to the world out there, because every 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 person has their own opinion, and it's really I found out later that it's none of my business what other people think about me, and I should have practiced that, but it does affect you, and so 
everybody would say, well, how, how can you make a living at that? Uh, that's, that's impossible. That, um, but the, the universe supported it. And my intention was, was focused on, you know, selling paintings and, and making sure the quality of the paintings were good. And, and because that focus of intention, because of having studied metaphysics since I was 16 years old, I realized the, the power of intention. Um, that was actually, I think, a title of one of Wayne Dyer's books, you know. And um, so I, I put those two forces together is the, the idea of the passion that I have and intention towards that passion. And the universe just filled in the, the blanks and, and here I am. And so uh, during that path, when I was in my early 20s, I, um, I studied with... Uh, number of people. Uh, one of them was Ramon Kelly, a well-known artist from Denver. And he told me, you, you do know, in order to do this representational art that you're pursuing, it's going to take you at least 20 to 25 years to learn how to do it. And then you can, then you can start producing really fine, fine art. And uh, I didn't believe him. <laughs> and he was right. But, um, you know, Every painting got better, and I, I went through so many phases. I traveled around the world. That was one of my passions. When I got a lot of extra money, I would go to Morocco and paint. I would go to Peru and paint. And, and, and so I, I was bringing all these subject matters. I probably painted more subject matters than anybody I know as an artist, and landscape and figures and uh, the whole Oh, I, I, I painted, I, I think I've painted on location something like 35 different countries that I'm not tooting my own horn, but it, it, that, that will, will definitely influence your art. And so I'm, I'm still in it. The universe is still supporting it. And, and that's, that's um, basically my story in a small, small nutshell. Well, it's a fascinating story. And um, I know I'd love to travel and I'm very, jealous of all the travels you've been through. So, um, you know, I just need to start my bucket list to start checking them off and follow a few uh, thousand miles in your footsteps, brother. You got it. And take your harmonica with you. Oh, I will. Yeah. I, yeah. Rogers, throw me under the bus a little bit. I uh, fired myself from trying to learn the guitar because I have no ability, but uh, I can fake it a little bit on a harmonica. So I've been playing around with that, but we won't, we won't, we won't tell anybody too much about that. Uh, Roger, one one quick question before we get into the the universe and consciousness, because I know that's something we've talked a lot about in art, and I'd love to kind of be a basis for today. But you know, yesterday we were talking with Phil Stark, and he's painted and lived around the United States. We were talking about how the light changes uh, with these thirty five different countries and everywhere you've traveled and lived and studied abroad with uh, all all the art that you've done. What what do you feel like? the changes in light and the, the mood and atmosphere uh, have when you're painting plain air like that on location? Well, the main thing is that you're basically, you're um, kind of a unit of perception as a human being. You, um, we live in a third density where there is um, polarity and this polarity is all relative. So, it, when you're in a given situation, because of the multiplicity of elements that I can see through my five, I, I would call them six senses, um, it's, it's, hard to, it's, it's really hard to do a comparative reality. Um, I think in terms of um, light that I like to work with, and I, uh, when I, after I studied with Clark Hewlings, he's, a, he's dead now, but he was a famous uh, American artist. One of the things I like about his work and, and, and another master from Spain, Joaquin Bautista Sorolla, um, they painted sunlight. And I found that the, the best sunlight I, I, can, I can see or have been around is, is in the Southwestern United States. And um, you know I, I found the light in Southern Spain really delightful. Um, there's been pockets here and there that but it was not so much probably about the light, it's about the relativity 
of the consciousness that you are experiencing that given day and everything is different. You try to, you know, most of us like to think that we see with our eyes, but I like to say that I see through my eyes and every single minute I'm a, I'm a different person. So it's, it's, there's no short answer to that. It's, um, it's, I would just go back and say it's, it's about relativity and the frequencies of the, that relativity because everything is frequency. <clears throat> well, that's, that's an awesome explanation and uh, I appreciate it because it's, it's always fascinating to me. You know, everyone kind of gravitates to the Southwest United States and you're like, is, is the light really that good? And of course I love it. I just bought property there, but Right. Uh, you know, obviously there's a reason it's a Mecca of art in the state of New Mexico and the land of enchantment because the light is so good there. And, uh, you know, I got a little lesson in light myself out there about how fast light changes on a mountain when you try to paint an owner's cabin because uh, <laughs> what I painted in the morning shouldn't look very good in the afternoon and vice versa. And I was like... <laughs> Yeah. we're not very good at this so you know that's that's the age-old question too is everybody's like well how do you say you know you paint you spent 45 minutes on this painting and you know blah 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 and it's like well do you know how many decades like uh the advice you got you know how long it took me to be able to create that piece in 45 minutes to capture this light because that is so difficult isn't it yes absolutely it's it's um like i said it's just um when when you're when you're trying to produce a piece of art and it with two dimensions with the illusion of three dimensions which is my intention because uh, i tend to uh, uh, attract towards more realism these days than impressionistic paintings and and even abstract art whatever that is um all art should be abstract but um you know the like i said that when when you are trying to do a piece of art there's you have to look at all of the elements involved and in, and in, that you have access to with the, with the, your consciousness that you're uh able to able to handle at that level and it's a it's it's a compilation of a matrix into a matrix of aesthetic elements that you have to try to work with it's there's value problems there are there are color problems there, which is one and the same, really. There's design and, and there, there's all these elements that come, come into a painting that you try to pull together to make them chord, just like your harmonica would do. Um, that, like on, on the guitar or any instrument, you, a chord, uh, uh, say an average major chord, is made up of three notes. And those frequencies vibrate within themselves and they create one note, which we call a chord, which is a very, I guess, a good example of how you would, how you describe how a painting is done. It is done through um, these organiz this engineering of these, these different elements into a matrix. You're dealing with uh, sacred geometry, which is something that I've studied throughout my life and whatever that is, but back uh, when I was studying art history, came across a, a man, uh, his name was Fibonacci. He grew up in, he was born in Italy. He was a Italian uh, mathematician in the 13th century. And his, he discovered sequencing of math, uh, of numbers that created these uh, sequences, which related to what we, we nowadays uh, recognize as sacred geometry, sacred shapes like this spiral of the galaxy, uh, how water flows down, down a toilet, you know, which direction, all the electromagnetic elements that are involved in uh, this sequencing uh, compiled with your frequency and consciousness, then you have, then you, then, and you have them working in a painting in a two dimensional surface, that's that's the that's the goal is and most people don't understand uh, in my world anyway, and that may be a judgment uh, is that, um, a lot of people that aren't familiar with art, they think it's just a picture. Oh, I can I'm just going to go out and I'm going to paint that mountain and I'm going to paint it as I see it. And I never paint anything as I see it because 
I always find a way to compile it or compose it with more uh, repetition of ge ge geometric elements or textures that where they play off of each other, each, each part of the painting and bend elements to emphasize more, say, perspective. If you're doing a painting that you want to uh, re relay, say, depth of illusion, the illusion of depth, say you want to do that, maybe that's one of the components you want to do. Then there's certain elements like Vermeer did many times, you bend those elements to emphasize it. You don't, you never paint it. I never paint what I see. Uh, I learn there's, um, nature has a way of giving you the fodder, but you know, you're the engineer, you're the captain of the boat and you put all these elements together to, to uh, into sequency and then then come up with this painting and hopefully it works, you know? Well, you've certainly been making it work for many decades now. So yeah, uh, let's not keep everybody, you know, hostage here. Let's get into the sacred geometry and the fodder of some of the, the pieces we have ready for everyone today. So I am in the middle of trying to share my screen. So if everyone will be a little patient with me. I'm learning how to do this as we speak. So uh, <clears throat> this first one is Chemiza Bloom. Uh, I'll let you take it away from here and talk about uh, what caught your eye to create this image and um, where you were and, and what all went into it. Okay, so we're talking about Chemisa Bloom. Mm -hmm. I, don't see, I don't see it on my screen, but um, I know which one that is. And so, um, Am I supposed to see it on the screen? I hope so, because I'm doing a share screen. I don't see it. <laughs> OK. Well, let me try this view. How about that? Is that, is that no, sure? No Chumisa Bloom. Oh, you know what? Here's what I have to do first. Good call. I have to do the share screen first. All right, there we go. See, keeping it. Oh, there nice. it is. Keeping it nice. Got it. There we go. We got I'll it. The slideshow, and then I'll do this so it's big. So there we go. Yeah. Perfect. Chemise of Bloom. Perfect. Off to the races. We're totally. I'll try not to pick my nose. Please don't. <laughs> If not, just kind of hold your soda can up. And... Well, this is a great one to start with because um, I sent that because if you look back here, uh, um, if you look back here on the on the easel, I'm I'm doing I'm doing a large version of this. This was intended as a as a as a study for a larger painting. And what I do, um, the painting I'm working on right now is a 36 by 48. That's, that's usually about as big as I get anymore. And when I do a painting that large, I usually do two or three studies. And so I sent two of the studies to you uh, in this presentation of this painting I'm working on. I, I chose this one, the Chemisa Bloom, um, because I like the geometry in it. I like the color. I like the, the feeling of this late, late, late evening sky. And like I said before, I was, I was really influenced by a number of artists, but the number one influence was, was Joaquin Soroya from Spain and then Clark Hewlings, who I got to study with here in Santa Fe before he died. I, and those, those two artists were, we're painting with light, I mean, sunlight. And I mean, sunlight is hard, very difficult to, to uh, manage because of the elements, the contrast. You have more lines, you have more edges that you have to deal with. Uh, another one of my instructors that I took a workshop from, uh, a famous artist, uh, Richard Schmidt, he's one of those artists that never, almost never paints sunlight because it's too hard to manage and produce a really good painting because of the value system range. Uh, his, his paintings are often 
you know, done masterfully with just five values. And oftentimes I, I, I cover the whole 10 value system. And so this is an example that the intention of this painting was to, to basically relate my, my, my love for where I live in New Mexico. Uh, it's, it's still somewhat third world in a lot of ways. And I, I have a tendency to be overly romantic with my painting. So I don't, I don't so much paint modern stuff like a street scene with, with you know, women, uh, women in pants and uh, you know, modern cars and stuff like that all over the place. I usually avoid that. I'm more attracted to uh, historical paintings and, and um, you know, nostalgic paintings uh, like the Romantic period in Europe somewhat, um, you know, it's all been done. So I mean, I know I'm not creating anything new. I'm just lucky that when I get up in the morning, um, I don't have to go to work, I go paint. And I've never, I've, never, I've been doing that for what uh, professionally, I think for 35 years since my late twenties, I have done nothing else. And so in this particular painting, um, you, you see the bas basically the patterns, the if you look at the sky, you see uh, very, very subtle geometric patterns working towards a focal point. In this painting, I have a, a, a major focal point and then I have a minor fo focal point that, that the geometry kind of takes you around. The, the shape of the mesa in the background is repeated in, all over in the foreground subtly. You have, you have lines that, you know, and this is a good example where I don't, I don't follow the physics, the Newtonian physics of the planet oftentimes so I can bend the idea of design. So in other words, what I'm saying is, is this, for example, this tree here might've cast a longer shadow. I don't worry about that because most people, probably 99% of the people would not see any, any bending of the physics. They probably wouldn't be able to see it because it's, it's, I make sure that it's, convincing or I don't leave it in the painting. And of course, it, you know, you've got New Mexico adobes here. Um, it's like an old, probably an old farm. And, and I basically composed this from a composite of a number of elements. This was not done on location, but I have painted on location so much in my life that I have developed what I call a visual vocabulary. And, and so I can basically, with relativity understanding of the, the, the value systems, uh, having learned that over the years, your palette, um, and it's, it's about value and the dark and light is more important than anything. Um, then, you, then you can manipulate these things. And so I, I have a bunch of patterns that are created with, with the, the um, shadow, uh, the, the darks, and then, and then, of course, the lights kind of try to repeat themselves, and it's just uh, it's an expression of how how it is here in New Mexico in the fall with the chamisa blooming. I, I think they call it rabbit brush in English. I think that's what it called called. And then during that period of time, there the asters are in full bloom. So it's complementary color violets and yellows that just scream. And it's, um, it's hard to manage color-wise, but I'm, I'm not much of a yellow guy, but I'm taking yellow therapies all the time. You know, I, Yellow is a color that I've always had problems with. So I, I, I kind of force myself to, to do more of it. So it's just a, a day in the life, you know, as John Lennon said, and that's what came out. And I like this one enough that I decided it would work well at, on a big format. And so you gotta understand when you, you have a, a space in a painting that might be a little iffy uh, and you don't see it, when you blow it up to a big one, it, <laughs> that, so no mistakes, but if you blow it up to a big one, that becomes more stark and then it becomes more of a problem. So that's the story on that one. Well, it is certainly a beautiful piece and a great way to start the slideshow for us to talk to the viewers about. But 
uh, <clears throat> again, I, I love these historical pieces you do and um, all the little little bitty pieces of detail here and there with the blue trim on the doors and the windows in the background. I just really feel like with those yellows, that contrast really makes that piece pop. So. Correct. And that, this is, a, this is a, a, another one of the studies for this big one that I'm doing now. Um, it, it, didn't win the, it didn't win the category of, of being the final study. Um, but you can see I, I, it's the same palette, basically the same palette. And it's, it, it tries to relate a very romantic, uh, quiet late night evening in, in New Mexico after a good rain, I think this one is called, yeah, after a good rain. Uh, uh, I'm looking at it now and I'm thinking that I, if I did it over again, I probably will rework it because a lot of the, um, a lot of the values are not quite what I want. The, 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 I tried to indicate that it had just ra rained and there's puddles on the, on the road and so forth. And they, they reflect the, the old truck in the, in the car and, I just have to lighten that up a, a little bit. I can see that now. Uh, and that's one issue for those people that are interested in getting into art is that, you know, when you, you think you're, you're never done with the painting, you know, if, you, you, if it hangs around the house long enough, it'll get reworked <laughs> at some point, you know, and, and it goes back to the, the fact that I was talking about before, but it's, it's because you're never the same person. You never wake up the same and it's, you're the observer, and um, every day for me is a is a new day in a, in a completely different uh, consciousness, really. But this one um, this one has the same elements, the same time of year, uh, the patterns in the sky, as you can see, uh, work in a in a geometric pattern to to bring the eye down to the focal area of the the little farm there, the, the truck. And red, um, as you can see, this is a dominantly green painting, a green blue painting. But uh, in, in, um, if, if you think about it, red is an interesting color. You, um, it, is the, the lowest, it is the lowest frequency. It's got the shortest band wave um, in, in, in the color spectrum, in the, in the color spectrum. It's the lowest frequency. And so when you add, for some reason, you add some red because of the way we are humanized. I, I, it's a mystery to me because I, I never knew this until I was in my 30s when I had an art dealer that tell me, well, you know, I've had this painting a while and it didn't sell. He says, take it home and put some red in it. <laughs> I would try it. I didn't believe him, but my God, it's true. Um, uh, people love little red accents. So I use them constantly in my paintings, whether it's a piece of junk or an old truck or a, 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 a woman's dress or a, you name it. I, I love playing with those elements. And um, so your eye automatically goes to the red truck immediately and it, it draws all the rest of the elements towards it too. And so that, um, that's, that, that's, that's an interesting concept. But you, you ask, try an experiment sometime and go around and ask 10 people. Uh, now, I, I don't want you to think about this, but you give me, uh, you give me a, a name of a tool. When I say, give me a name of a tool and you give me a name of a color and don't think about it, just respond immediately. So you say, you know, give me a name of a tool and they'll say hammer. Nine tenths of them will say hammer. Give me a name of a color, red. Why that is, I don't know, but try it yourself. It's an it's interesting uh, experiment. <clears throat> well, I'll get a red hammer at the store because uh, I need one. <laughs> need one for the park anyway. And you just, you just sold me. I think I need to get a red hammer. So it's a crowd pleaser. <laughs> red harmonica. <laughs> hey, there you go. Well, this one um, looks like my title didn't get cropped in, so I'll need to fix that later. Uh, but I believe this one was. Um, I think it's Chamisa in Winter. It is. It is. It's so another Chamisa painting. 
apologize kinda like, to everyone for not having the title up. I'm not sure what happened there. I guess I didn't hit the save button right, but um, <clears throat> I think this is kind of the the hidden star of the show, if you ask me. I, I, I'm a I'm a sucker for you know a good snow scene in, in a New Mexico scenery, and uh, I love I love the the tire tracks in this and i can see the little splash of red in there but i'll quit talking because i'm not the artist and i'll let you take it away <laughs> no you're doing great yeah it's it's got all the elements that i often put in my paintings and and uh i had a teacher one time that bill reese that said you can't paint snow unless you're standing in it and so i think having painted outside in the winter enough this was not painted on location this was painted um in a small series of winter landscapes that i i did uh last year they're covid paintings <laughs> and, and uh it just um once again it, it just it has a curved linear feel to it not only in the trees you can't see the trees but uh if you look at the painting the trees repeat the shapes in the road. And uh, and this was taken from um, a little, little place, I think in Los Ojos uh, in Northern New Mexico, the idea of it. And of course uh, there were, uh, the roads were straight like the last painting we analyzed. And I didn't like that. So I, I did a curvilinear entrance that takes you into the painting all the way back to your focal areas. And the and the even down to the the dirt marks left in the tracks of the snow, that's a repetition of what's going on above. They, they could be branches, you know. But what it does is it repeats the shapes, and then adds and and, and then physically it it actually facilitates as a uh, an element that happens in the winter time when t tires, you know go on a road, you've got dirt coming up and there's all kinds of uh, things that happen. And just to play in light, if you see the warm, cool effect of sunlight, you know, the, um, the edges of the, the road paths or whatever you want to call them, you'll see there's a number of colors from warm to cool. Starts cool with the greens and the blues in the foreground, then it moves into a secondary reflection reflective art or light that re reflects the, the extreme light that's hitting perpendicularly to the sun on the tracks. So that there's those subtleties that add to the, to the charm of the, of the, of the, of the painting itself. It, it gets, it, it gives you an opportunity to inject more color into the painting and uh, and not get away from, like I said before, and not get away from the idea of perceptual um, representational realism. One of the things I like that you did is in the foreground here with this shadow, you know, being from Oklahoma, we would see paintings from New Mexico, Wyoming, Colorado, depending on where the artist lived. And we would see these, like you've hit there in the, with the green where the snow will refreeze. Well, here, if we get snow, you know, a day later, it's melted. And so yeah. very rare here in Oklahoma until a few recent storms that we ever, you know, as an Oklahoman, you're, ever, you're able to actually see that. And so that's what I like is that you use those cool colors and you got that green in there as you curve the road to really help with that, you know, consciousness of the perspective of that curved road going into the piece. And, you know, I really like how, you know, I know that I'm talking with my hands, but as the road curves in, you know, with the shapes and the composition of this piece, it leads your eye back down and back to the, back to that. And it's probably the second or third time I, I, you know, wandered with my eyes through the piece that I was able to actually see what you had done there. And I really, really like that little touch there. It's really nice. And it's um, like, I don't, uh, so many snow scenes I've done where you, the snow is not, deep enough to cover the ground cover. Sometimes it covers everything, but um, I, took the, I took the option of taking the color of the winter trees and the buildings, uh, earth tones, and in the foreground, uh, injecting the color of the indication of this, 
and just enough grass growing out of the, uh, the snow to, to bring that color down into the foreground. It's very subtle, but it, it, it works. Well, it does work. And I think it's, like I said, it's uh, <clears throat> kind of the hidden gem of the show. I hope, hope someone pounces on it and adds this one to their collection because I think it needs to go find a home. And it's, uh, it's an absolutely okay. stunning piece. I really, really enjoy that one. And I think what's happened, and I apologize to our viewers, is I was trying to maximize space for the image. And I think our titles are too high on the slideshow. So this one's titled Yellowstone uh, with a bison and having a nice cool drink of water. So uh, I'll let you take it away on this one. Yeah, this one was an interesting painting. I did a, uh, I, I did a, a small series of these because I, um, you know, bison don't like to, um, they're not, they don't have an affinity to, to pose well, you know what I mean? They, they're, 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 they're hard to get close to. And in fact, you, it's very, very, very dangerous to get close to them. And I was, I was in Yellowstone. This was pre COVID, uh, material. Um, I, I've always done a certain amount of wildlife paintings. And uh, in fact, I started my career painting um, a fair amount of wildlife. And my, always my favorite creature to paint was the, the bison, the American bison. A lot of people call them buffalo, but they're not, they're bison. And um, what I tried to do here was uh, create the experience I had. I was cruising along uh, on this road. It was a side road in the park where, where, where tur tourists go and uh, out way out away, quite a ways, like a half a mile out there, the, the, these her this herd of bison were in the rut and they were, the, the males were very aggressive. And although I don't denote that here, I don't see, I don't show two of them going at each other. They were mating. And so you, the, the last thing you wanna do is get near a herd of buffalo that are in the rut. You just, you don't want to do that. And, but they were so far away. And I, I, had, um, I had my camera with a telephoto lens, but it just wasn't enough. So I just started walking out there. And then as I got closer, I, I got down on my knees. This was a great experience, kind of tension. There's a lot of tension, but so I, I heard this bus pull up on the road below me where I had my truck parked and a bunch of tourists got out of it and a, and a guide. He says, see out now, I want to show you. This is, this is how people get killed in Yellowstone. <laughs> they were referring to me and I was, I was crawling on my belly uh, very slowly. And, you know, they would look up. I got close enough to get some great photographs, but it was, it was very dangerous. It was kind of stupid, but I figured, you know, you, and there, you can't outrun a a bison you can't you can't out, out run, run a bison so you just no. don't want to disturb them but um i thought it was a a very very wonderful um scenic uh occasion where um they were walking through this little river and uh, it was there and it was so reflective and beautiful and and, and it was it's, the evening was coming on and and that you know just um, I, it's, once again, it's a composite, but because um, uh, nothing is is has a has a pre-made composition, as you would say. But you know, the, the shapes in the sky repeat the shapes, and the same same thing. It's a parroting effect, and um, just I have a tendency to bring peace for in my work than aggression. I I have never painted like a, a historical painting with indigenous people uh, on horses with guns. I, I can't do that sort of stuff. All of my, all of my paintings have always been denoting a, a, a feeling of peace and tranquility. And that's what this was trying to relate. Well, you did a great job because <clears throat> it is so peaceful. And I think what probably my favorite part is, is the, the soft tones of that evening light right before it's about to go. But right when you still get all those great iridescent effects in the water as the sun sets and uh, between the trees reflecting in there and the the bison or the tatanka 
as they may be referred to uh, reflecting in the water. I just, I love how it's, it's, it's understated, but it, it's really, it ties in with the moment so well. Uh, and I think you did such a great job capturing that. And we're all glad that you made it out safe. And I'm um, sorry that your <laughs> guide was hazing you a little bit, but um, I think that's the last one in our shared screen. So, but I hope everyone enjoyed uh, the tour of Rogers Pieces and um, they're on our website too, the Grapevine Gallery, OKC.com. And you can call, email, or text uh, Clay at the Grapevine. And we'd love to help add some of these pieces to your collection, which I think they would be in great company with Roger's work and whatever's already in your existing collection. So, well, Roger, uh, what's, um, what's on the horizon for, for you as an artist, workshops, shows, what all you got going on coming up? Well, like everybody else, you know, COVID just flipped the reality into a different reality. Um, I, I just, I just intend following my solar plexus and um, energies. I, I, my dharma, which is a Hindu word to describe um, your calling, um, is is to be still be an artist, and I. I will continue doing that um, probably the rest of my life as long as I can and and get better at it, you know, because I feel like I'm it's like um, they have said Rembrandt was quoted on his deathbed as saying, I, I wish I had another lifetime to paint so I could learn how to do it. And that's <clears throat> kind of how I feel. It's uh, I feel like I'm in the elementary stages of, of understanding some of the, the, the mystical beauty of, the, of what we're able to do with, with art. It's, um, art can be extremely profound and it, um, as, as most people will understand and once it, they have the interest to, to, to study it and they'll, it's addictive, it's, uh, it's like a, it's like an addiction I, I, I never could compare to anything. It's, it's, a, it's something that it, I, I look forward to doing every day of my life. Um, so I don't, I don't have any plans right now. I, I'm hoping my next trip will be to go back um, to Peru. I've done a lot of uh, indigenous paintings, uh, figurative stuff throughout Latin America and Peru, Peru is one of my favorite places to go. And then I wanna go back there uh, partially because my wife has never been there and she wants to see some of the mis mystical things that there are to see there. And so that, that's in the, hopefully in the near future that we'll see what happens. <clears throat> well, you're, you've painted quite a bit in South America. What is it exactly? I mean, you, you just brought up the mystical qualities of South America, Peru, some places like that, but uh, would you like to kind of share with everyone just what is there, just the general scenery or is there something in-, in, in The attraction? Yeah. Uh, there's many. Um, one of the main attractions, if you, uh, you know, um, if you study some of the his history on the planet. When I went to when I went to school, I spent seven years in formal education. Uh, you know, you learn the history of say X country or this or that or. And now that I'm older now and um, look back on that, uh, none of that was really uh, really true. A lot of it was uh, there was a lot of error involved in what we learned, and one of the things that in it really intrigues me about Peru and other places, uh, like our last trip to Egypt, same place, uh, same elements, is that um, these inner, these mysteries of, of interplay between um, cosmic elements of our, of our galaxy. There have been, there have been, there's so many mysteries in Peru, for example, that you look at it and the human being who they, the, like the Inca, Incaica culture, built this temple, for example. And you look at the rocks and the way they, all these intriguing uh, elements that engine of engineering 
there had to be outside help. I like that mystical uh, interplay between what, what actually was here and who influenced it. You know, now we have evidence of alien technologies all over the planet. Peru is, is one place that it's extremely obvious. They have found corpses and, and it's, it's documented science there. And so that's one thrill is seeing that. I love the indigenous people are still in their culture. They still, especially the women, they still wear their traditional dress all the way back to the times of the Paraca culture, which is pre-Incan. And, and um, you know, they, they're just, so colorful and innocent and and loving people. They're 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 um, they're kind, and it, and, it, and you know it's just a tremendous um, opportunity for art and well and adventure too. It's you know I love to we love to hike and so we'll do a lot of that and Peru is a great place for that and the food. Ceviche, where can you go wrong? Yeah. Oh, it's one of my favorites, brother. It's one of my <laughs> favorites. Love some good ceviche. I've actually made a vegan version of that and Caesar now that I don't get to have uh -huh. dairy anymore. So, uh, uh -huh. well, one last question. Um, whether someone's a new artist in their 20s or someone's had a career and they retired at 55, 65 and said, I'm going to start painting. Um, if someone's going to get started and they're just learning or they're wanting to make a go of it or try their hand in, in painting, um, almost as if you were talking to yourself when you first began, what would be, what would be your best advice as far as, you know, some artists say, well, don't get too caught up into the detail, get into values, or, you know, if someone's trying to, to really learn how to paint, what, what would, what would be Roger Williams advice? Yeah, that's a uh, excellent question. Um, cause, um, I've done a lot of workshops in the last five years in the studio and outdoor plein air workshops. And the majority of the people that take them for me, I have an occasional young person it's just starting out. And then, but most of them are baby boomers that have retired and they've always wanted to do art. And some of them have been doing it for a long time, but they, want to get better at it. And so when I started teaching again, I used to teach when I was in my twenties at a university for just a couple of years. And I, I gave that up because I didn't think I had anything to share, any knowledge. But it, then now that I got older um, and I'm still alive remarkably, <laughs> um, I, I promised myself I would not teach workshops about art. They would be about human experience art would be peripheral because the reason for that is I believe you can learn how to do art faster if, if, if speed is what you wanna learn and you wanna get better. If you play the guitar, you have to practice, right? That's a given. But what the big thing is that people don't understand is that when you enter into anything, you try to get your consciousness in a place that is the, at the highest vibration that you possibly can. And the way to do that is to become present. Know that the present moment is all you have. You know, there, you can't, the, the past is gone. You know, what, what is the saying? The, the past, uh, I can't remember it now, but um, being present and taking that moment and not trying to shift it into the future is, is the best way that you can react to a learning, a process of any kind. The past is history, the future is mystery, the now is a gift, that's why they call it the present. Well, I think you couldn't be more 100% correct because you know to be truly present when you're trying to create art, even though I'm not any good at it, I would think you'd have to get into that moment that you're trying to capture and tune everything else out and, and really focus on the task at hand. So I think that's an excellent piece of advice and perspective. Yeah, and it, what that does to you, if you, if you, if we, and we're all wired for it, uh, is that um, this, this planet and the, the around us, you can, you can do one, 
you can, you know, you can have two wolves, like the Native Americans say, you can have two wolves inside your body. One, one is, one is a, a wolf of beauty and the other one is a wolf of fear. Which one are you going to feed? And, and it, it, the same thing is true with wherever you're at. There's always, there is always beauty. And if you're present, then you can allow that beauty to come into your reality. And it, it, it ups the game. It, and, and what that does, it, it, it sequences a process that uh, in scientific terms, it, it, if you get kind of high enough in your frequency, your body um, excretes um, dopamine and oxytocin and chemicals like that, that, that up kind of give you a, a feeling of, um, I don't know, I, I, I can conquer the world sort of thing. And that it's an energetic thing that happens to me when I'm present. Um, my consciousness is higher. Hence, I'm going to do a better brush stroke. I'm going to be able to see better because I'm refining it down. I'm eliminating any kind of uh, obstructions. Like I can't, like Einstein said, you know, I can, you, there's two sayings, you know, I can do it I, or I can't do it. And they're both right. It just depends on what you decide. Well, we thank you so much for feeding the wolf that's in search of beauty and not yeah. the wolf that's in search of fear. So uh, thank you for making the world more beautiful. And again, if anyone would like to make your collection more beautiful, uh, the Grapevine Gallery would love to help you out by getting one of Roger's pieces into your collection or another one if you already have one. But Again, that's uh, grapevinegalleryokc.com. Uh, you can email Clay, call Clay, text Clay. And not that I'm trying to talk about myself in the third person, but um, this is <laughs> me as a video host talking about the guy that owns the gallery. So i uh, love to help everyone out. Uh, thank you again, Roger, so much for your time today and telling us a little bit more about your perspective with your work. We appreciate it very much. Great. And, thank you uh, for having me. Make sure you give our best to your lovely bride. You got it. Same back at you. All righty. Well, thank you all very much for joining us.